Grace, mercy, and peace be to God, our Father, Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this first Sunday after Christmas. The Gospel reading today will serve as our text, but I want to add one verse before verse 22, as it is reads as follows. When the eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Here is the text, please now join me in prayer. Father, we thank you, O Lord, that your servant Christ came into our flesh, and like Paul said, in the fullness of time, born of woman, born under the law, redeemed under the law. We thank you that our Savior was willing to do all of this for us. We thank you that, O Lord, in his death and resurrection, you give us life from what he has offered to you. Help us, O Lord, always treasure this life that he offers to us now through his means of grace. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Christ, many times in the past, the church would celebrate services on New Year's Day, but it seems like all of that has kind of gone out of the wind lately. Um, New Year's Eve services and New Year's Day services are dying. And maybe there's a reason for that, it's because they're really not church holidays anyway. If there needs to be a holiday on January 1st, a church holiday, it would be the circumcision of Jesus. Now, some churches who are still having the New Year's Day services <coughs> really focus on that, that they're going to celebrate the circumcision of Christ and make it a religious holiday, just not a secular one at the beginning of the new year. For eight days after Christ was born, he was circumcised. And as you know, with circumcision, there comes a little bit of blood. So when people see blood, not all, but some, some get a little queasy with blood. The Bible may have a reason of why this happens. In Leviticus 17, we see, for the life of a creature is in the blood. The life of every creature is in blood. If this Bible verse is true with us today, which I believe it is, it means to say that when you see something blood leaking out of a human life leave that human being. That is not a pleasant thought to see life will be seeking out for a human person. Maybe that's the reason why many people are pleasing with us, that we give thanks to nurses and doctors and other first responders that are able to handle handle this so that they can preserve life. But because life is so associated with blood, God puts a protective hedge around him. No one is to take the blood of man. That's what it said in the Genesis chapter 9 after the flood, because it is what keeps the image of God alive. It is a sacred liquid, so to speak. No one is to touch it. God gave it. He's the only one who can ungift it. But that wasn't the case for many pagan religions. They kind of believed blood had power. They believed that if the gods in the heavens were to see blood being poured out for human beings, that they would be moved to answer a request. Maybe you might remember the story of Elijah at Mount Carmel. I love that story. Elijah is having a little contest. He tells the priest of Baal, that we will set up two altars, you set up one to Baal, I will set up one to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And then we'll call on our gods. And whoever sends the fireball down from heaven to light up the sacrifice will be recognized as the true God of Israel. And the priest of Baal said, sounds like a deal. What do you do? So they get their altar ready and they put their sacrifice on it. They begin crying and crying to Baal in heaven. Eventually, Elijah gets confident. He says, Oh, maybe if you cry louder, you probably see me. They cry louder and louder and louder. Elijah comes him even further. He says, Oh, maybe he's not home or maybe he's busy. And I like how he gets very cynical when he says to the people of Baal, Maybe he's in the bathroom. They weren't winning the case. 
And therefore, they began to do something which they thought would seal the deal with God's veil. They began to cut themselves. Okay, you look at the next verse. They cried out aloud and caught themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. Oh, Baal, see our blood. Now do something. Send that fireball of heaven to show that you are the true God. Well, they poured out their blood with vanity because there is no God but the name of Baal. They're clean to the wind upon that fear. And then you have the prophet Elijah. He uh, gets his altar, puts a sacrifice on it, and he's going to make it a big challenge for God when he tells him to throw a whole bunch of water on it. Seven times the worth of water. Put water in the temple. Eventually, probably, it answers the call of Elijah with one flea, and the fireball of heaven comes and lights up that sacrifice. Yahweh is known as the true. Pagan religions didn't really necessarily respect blood as much as the religion of Yahweh. But there were some instances which we know of in the Bible where God sanctioned loss of human blood. And one was circumcision. <clears throat> circumcision was an act God asked Abraham to do upon himself to verify that he believed the promises of God was giving him many promises. He was going to be the father of many nations. He was going to have his descendants receive this inheritance. Now, here you have to believe what I'm promising. If so, then circumcise yourself. And Abraham does, and all of Israel and I does as well. God sanctioned the law of blood, but in circumcision, it's not a law for the baby boy God. This gives a little interesting story of what takes place. Moses and his life before us. Moses is called by God to go into Egypt, perform miracles, and get Pharaoh to meet his people. So Moses answers the call of God, and he takes his wife Sephora, who is not of the family of Abraham. And on the way, God seeks to kill Moses, which is odd, isn't it? He just called Moses. Save his people of Israel, but how can you guys save him if he's dead? And Sephora knows the reason why. She knows why God is trying to kill her husband. It's because their son is searching the work for him. This is where you see a spiritual battle in the household. It was a mixed marriage. Moses followed the God of Yahweh, Sephora followed some other God who didn't believe in circumcision. She believed it had to be barbaric, and she actually said no to any circumcision on her son Gershom. Moses succumbed. He was not the spiritual leader of the house of Lord, that right? Zephora won the day. But when this event happened, when Zephora recognized that God was trying to kill Moses because his son was not circumcised, she relented. It's just a matter of fact, right? You wouldn't have. A guy like Moses go into Egypt and talk to these people of Israel about all the promises of God and ask them to believe in him. He's got to show belief in it too. His message is not going to be strong if his actions don't back him up. So God is making sure this event happens. Zephora gets frustrated. According to the writer of Exodus, Zephora takes a flint, cuts off her son's foreskin, and throws it at Moses. Out of disgust, this is the only way to save my husband's life. I will do it, but I don't agree with it. And she said, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. And after that, the world left him alone. Our Savior Christ, the Son of God, submits to circumcision. As you can see in this picture, Jesus Christ is being presented according to the law of Abraham to be circumcised to show the sign that this child believes in the promise. It's amazing that even in the Old Testament, babies can believe. It's not just in the New of Baptism. The baby is brought into the covenant of Abraham. That before Abraham was born, God had foreordained, God had elected, that 
that this Savior from the world would be born of the seed of Abraham and would submit to the laws of Moses. That was his plan. And so Jesus is born from Abraham, and Jesus here was circumcision, submits to the laws of Moses. He comes to those born under the law to redeem those under the law, and it starts here. Blood is shed, but the baby survives. Jesus is circumcised. And according to the law of Moses, his mother had to be purified. There are 32 days between verse 21 and verse 22 of Luke. The boy is circumcised on the eighth day, and the mother needs to be purified on the 40th day. So on the 40th day, they're bringing Jesus into the temple to give a presentation, not be circumcised, and to have Mary purified. Between the birth and the 40 days, Mary was not to touch anyone. He didn't make clean, because that wasn't defiled. But on the 40th day, there was a chance for restoration. And so on the 40th day, you can see that Mary is being brought to the temple, and look what's in the hands of Joseph. The right of purification for the mother was to be a lamb and with birds. Do you see a lamb anywhere in that picture? No. Do you see birds in the cage? The law of Moses allows substitution to take place in your four. They're offering the sacrifice of the poor for purification. Here is the two turtle dollars for a pair of scissors. This kind of indicates to us that apparently the white man hadn't come yet. Forty days after Jesus was born, they still didn't have money to buy a lamb. There was no gold in the white man. So they gathered what they had, fulfilled the law of Moses to purify Mary, and get the pigeons or the turtle doves. And lots of blood of animal blood was given. All blood is poured out because it is blood that Christ God has given for our own animal blood. Things do seem to take a turn, though, in the New Testament, do they not? The whole thing about this blood and what? That we see the Father ask more than drops of blood to be given by his son for certain. We see that all of his blood is being given on the cross of Calvary. Blood is out for it, and the blood is life. Life of Jesus is out for for us. This is because, according to the author, Hebrews says, it is impossible for the blood for the blood of bulls and goats to atone for sin. All of those actions in the Old Testament, those turtle doves, those pigeons, those lambs, all of those animal blood were just a foreshadow of the human blood that could actually forgive sin. But the reason why this blood could forgive sin is it wasn't just human blood, you have to remember, it's divine blood. It's God's blood. And because it's God's blood, it can forgive the sins of the entire world. Because it's God's blood, it gives salvation to all people. A lot of power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Life and blood are obviously connected to this. Jesus loses blood, Jesus loses life. That you and I have life. One law, he proceeds by God for our salvation. A second law, he proceeded in our redemption. Well, now, people were told in the Old Testament not to drink. Deuteronomy 12, verse 23. Only be sure that you need not the blood. What is the life? You may as not eat the life with the flesh. Anything you may need to be drained from blood. You are not to eat the life. So when we get to the Mosaic covenant, again, animal blood is shed. It's a sealed deal. But following Deuteronomy, you're not to drink the animal blood. If you look at the next picture here, you see a picture of Moses sprinkling blood on the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant. As he goes around sprinkling thousands and thousands of people with the blood of a bull sacrificed to God. Now you But how things take a turn, do they not? When we hear Jesus Christ take a cup, blessing, 
and say, this is the blood of the new covenant. Just pour it out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. We are told in Deuteronomy not to drink it. And the sacrament being offered to God says, drink it. This is one of the confessions that we say in our church body that that bread and wine are not representations. That bread and wine are hopes. We like to use the prepositions like this. In wisdom under the bread and wine is the body and blood of Christ. In wisdom under we eat and drink of the life-giving body and blood of Jesus Christ. Life-giving for eternity. One thing that I the reason why I like this picture where you see Jesus Christ on the cross and out of the hands and out of the side of blood being poured out are receiving the very divine blood of Jesus in our body, and it begins to run through our veins. It strengthens our faith, forgives our sins, and it purifies us. Makes us clean. It's an odd connection. 